Well, this week the National Party revealed it wanted a new coal-fired electricity generator in the Hunter. Joining me live now to discuss this is Steve Hamilton, the Chief Economist from Blueprint Institute. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. Is this a realistic idea? No, uh, g'day Charlotte, thank you for having me. No, I think uh, the right approach for a modern political party uh, today is to kind of recognise that the transition to zero emissions electricity is inevitable, right? The, the eastern seaboard states have all committed to 50% renewables in their energy grid by 2030. And in order to get there, rather than open coal-fired power stations, what we're really going to have to do, and there's really no way around this, is to close some. And what we really need from, from governments is, is a sort of recognition of that inevitability and a plan for how we might get there. Now, the last thing we want to do is take a step backwards and, and introduce an asset um, that, that, that really has a, has, a, has a numbered kind of uh, day. Mm. So on that point, it, just in layman's terms, why does it have a numbered day? So the trouble is uh, a, a solar array has, uh, can produce energy at zero, zero dollars, right? When the sun is shining, as long as you have solar panels, they produce energy for free, okay? The, now, when the sun isn't shining at nighttime, what we need is something to fill in the gap that that, 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 that solar energy leaves behind. Now, the, just about the worst technology you can think of to fill in that gap is a coal-fired power plant, right? Because a coal-fired power plant can't be switched on or off whenever you feel like it, right? It, it, it's just not designed for that kind of environment. So in a, in a future where we have a lot of renewable energy in the grid, which is, again, inevitable, what we really need is, is, is a different kind of uh, electricity supply that can better complement renewable energy, and that's things like uh, batteries, pumped hydro, and, yes, uh, gas, uh, which, which can all help to fill the gap left by uh, renewable energy sources. So in that world, coal doesn't really have a role to play. Okay, so in terms of setting up uh, these new renewables and uh, winding down coal, economically speaking, how sound is that argument and how much investment would it take to set up those new assets? Yeah, so the, the trouble is, you know, Australia's most recent coal plant that, that was built in 2009 is Blue Water Power Plant in Western Australia. And just, you know, just before Christmas, the owners of that plant wrote the value of that asset down to zero dollars, right? So it, it, even setting aside government intervention, the private market is recognising that the value of these coal plants is zero, Right. So there is no commercial basis on which to invest in coal, coal power today. So if the government were to do it, it would be sort of throwing uh, good money after bad. It would be building white elephants. What we would much rather see is the government put resources into the future, right, into, into assets that are likely to be worth more in the future than they are today. Mm. Uh on another topic, but it is still centred pretty much around the same thing, Steve, Chris Bowen has now been appointed to uh, Albanese's shadow cabinet with the climate portfolio. What changes can we expect uh, in this new appointment? Well, I think the, the appointment is really welcome. So what this recognises is, is that the massive political shift that has happened on renewable energy and, and climate change over the last decade. So Labor has kind of been in the wilderness, right, since its defeat in 2013 without really any climate policy. So to the last election, they had mm. no target mm. that they took to, took to the election, right? So what, what we see with Bowen's appointment... So well no, and, and, and so, you know, the government gets a lot of criticism, but the opposition is at sea on this issue. So what, what we see with, with Bowen's appointment, I think, is something that's very welcome, which is recognising that climate change is no longer a, uh, an environmental or a moral issue, but an economic one, right? The future of climate change in our political sphere is about who, Liberal or Labor, is better placed to manage what is going to be an inevitable transition, right? And who can exploit the positive economic opportunities that that transition presents? So how do they do that? Uh, well, I think that the key thing is to recognise that it's not doom and gloom. 
right? Mm-hmm. So the, the renewable energy boom that has to come from a, a transition to, to, to net zero uh, is going to create many jobs in, in, in the regions in Australia where these were built. And, and a lot of the resources that will power this transition to net zero, we in Australia have in abundance, right? So just like we were the lucky country in the 20th century, we being a big, flat, hot, windy uh, island are extremely well placed to capitalize in the 21st century, right? So the political party that recognizes that fact mm. and can and can sell that to the Australian people, I think will do very well. Well, that that's uh, my next question for you, uh, Steve. How does the Labor Party appeal to its base by keeping people in their jobs, but also uh, make the point of having better climate policy than the government would? How can, well, you, good, how can you get that message across that right. you, it doesn't have to be one or the other? A really good example is coal. So, you know, the... the the, the Greens and the Labor Party, elements the left of the Labor Party, I think have, have really done themselves a disservice by demonising coal, for example. Mm. So instead of making this coal the enemy, what you can really do is recognise that actually coal has a, a significant role to play in Australia, even 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 if we decide to commit to net zero, even if we decide to decarbonise our electricity grid. So instead of making the debate about whether coal is good or bad, an alternative is to recognise that metallurgical coal, right, is the majority of our coal production, and that is secure for decades, right, because we haven't quite figured out the, the, a way around metallurgical coal in, in steelmaking. Mm. The thermal coal that, that we produce is mostly exported, Right, mm. and and that will continue to be demanded, and it really is nothing to do with with Australia's decision. The the Australian coal generation sector, the the coal fired power plants, really take a tiny fraction of our whole uh, coal mining output, and mm. so you know if Labor can can figure that out, that you can actually simultaneously support coal mining, support the, you know, generation of jobs and, and, and massive economic value to Australia, and also support the transition of our energy sector, to me, that's a, that's a significant political opportunity in places like Queensland. Steve, that was very well explained. I liked uh, all your analysis there. Thanks so much for coming on and chatting with me this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Me too, Charlotte. Thanks. Well, coming up,